Psalm 42. This is the first of the second book of the Psalter. In this book, the Psalms are brought together from various sources. Psalms 42 to 49 from the sons of Korah, the temple musicians. Psalm 50 is the Psalm of Asaph, the founder of a temple group. 51 to 65 and 68 to 70 are Psalms of David. Solomon uh, in, contributes Psalm 72. And there are three anonymous Psalms 66, 67 and 71. Books 1 and 2 probably are different compilations of the Psalms. Book 1 is almost certainly compiled differently to Book 2. The prayers of David the son of Jesse are ended is Psalm 72 verse 20. But there are then another 18 Psalms of David beyond this, evidence of editing from different sources. Two Psalms, Psalms 53 and 70, are almost duplications of material in Book 1. And also in Book 2, Elohim is used as the name for God, and largely, but not completely, replaces the use of Yahweh in Book 1. It's basically the same as us having Psalms which use Thou, and Psalms which use You, or Psalms which use God, and Psalms which use Lord. We see evidences in the Psalms of little collections that were essentially brought together for use in all of Israel. Psalm 42 is, has the title of a mascal, which means something like a psalm to make use of or make wise for the prudent. It means an efficacious or skillful psalm. And the Greek version understood this as a psalm of understanding. Psalm 42 has to be read with Psalm 43 in reality, because the two psalms are almost certainly one psalm. And we can see this by the soliloquy, Why go I mourning? in Psalm 42 verse 9 and Psalm 43 verse 2. And the refrain, closing both parts of 42, also comes in 43 verse 5. And the whole thing really is very clearly one piece. It is the lament of a temple singer exiled in the north, see 2 Kings 14 verse 14, near the rising of the Jordan River, who longs to go back to God's house and turns that longing into a resolute faith and hope in God himself. The location is probably right on the frontier, near the border of the Jordan, not far from the source of its river on the great caravan route between Syria and the Far East, on the slopes of Mount Hermon. He's probably a priest or a Levite, forcibly separated from the choral service of, of the temple. In 1 Chronicles 6, verses 16 to 33, we see Korahites were professional musicians. In the older documents of the Psalms, the singers and porters were mentioned, separately from the Levites. And that also happens in, in Ezra, chapter 7 verses 2 and 24, chapter 10 verses 23 and 24, and Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 1. Therefore, one of the divisions of the body of musicians who were treated as Levitical were the Korahites. Whatever the psalmist was doing in the far north of Israel, whether a refugee, a prisoner of war, an exile, Whatever he was doing, the point of the psalm is that he was away from his home in Jerusalem, away from the shrine and the ministry he was called to. He's always in God's presence, yet at certain moments feels remote from it. God is remote enough for him to feel deserted, and yet God is near enough for him to talk to. Verse 1, as the deer pants for streams of water. Pictures, images of deers, flocks of deers, in the deserts of Syria, gathered around watercourses, braying, panting for water. And often there is a real noise. People who've been there tell me that there's a real noise as the deer pants for the water. My soul pants for you, O God, in the same way we as followers of God long 
for God in the way that a deer, a thirsty deer, longs for water. Verse 2, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The term thirst is the same as that used in Psalm 63 verse 1, and also has the idea of fainting within it. The Hebrew suggests a weariness. If you look at Genesis 25 verses 29 and 30, you will remember the story of Esau. His condition after hunting was similar to this word, thirst, fainting. God is the subject of the thirst in this particular passage in Psalm 42. And that's quite unusual, because often the, the, the term thirst is used of thirsting after righteousness or knowledge or power. Thirsting after the living God, the idea of God being the source or fountain of life. Jesus gives this idea of the Holy Spirit, out of your hearts shall flow rivers of living water. God is named as the living God in Psalm 84 verse 2, another of the temple psalms. In Psalm 36 verse 9, God is seen as the fountain of life. And it is clear that the Jews saw God as a God who was alive, full of life and vitality. And then later in that verse, it speaks about appearing before God. And Exodus 23 verse 17 uses this unusual phrase for frequenting the sanctuary. It's also seen in Psalm 84 and verse 7. Going on to verse 3, we see tears. My tears have been my food night and day. And tears are linked to meat in this particular psalm but in psalm 80 verse 5 they're linked to bread in psalm 102 verse 9 there's a sense of eating and drinking linked to deep sadness where is thy god is a bitter taunt a taunt by the psalmist's enemies see psalm 79 verse 10 or 115 verse 2 or you can go to Joel chapter 2 verse 17 to see a similar use of bitter taunting. I went with the multitude. The poet evokes being with the crowd at some great festival, probably the festival of tabernacles. Shouts of joy and thanksgiving and the festive crowd join together. It's an excited crowd. And the word festive literally means dancing or reeling for joy. See Exodus chapter 5 verse 1 or Exodus 23 verse 41. And we also see a link to David. You may remember in 2 Samuel 6 verses 14 to 16, David danced before the Lord. And it's a similar sort of word that is being used here. Moving on to chapter 5. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. This is the refrain that breaks into the psalm in two places, here in verse 11 and then 43 verse 5. We see here the spirit of faith struggling against the spirit of dejection. Downcast, perhaps is better translated as bowed down. And the word disturbed, the Hebrew word, is similar to our word for humming. And the idea is of an internal emotional turbulence. If you want to look at Isaiah 16 verse 11, you can see that as well. Moving on to verse 6. My soul is downcast or cast down. The psalmist feels and expresses his sense of dejection, a deep sense of grief and disquiet that cannot be continued we can see in matthew 26 verse 38 jesus in gethsemane with similar deep feelings within him my soul is overwhelmed says jesus with sorrow and then moving on to john chapter 12 verse 27 now my heart says jesus is troubled and it's that sort of disturbance and troubling which is expressed in verse 6 the physical description of the land shows that the poet is almost but not quite in exile and he's looking back at the beloved country he is leaving and it is disappearing its sacred 
summits are disappearing. Moving to verse 7, deep calls to deep. And this echoes Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 because the word deep, tehom, is the word that is used as the the spirit hovers over the face of the deep. These are half-formed things within, but it, they're, they're, they're very deep. Literally, it, it actually it could be translated flood or floods call to floods. It's a description of the winding rapids of the Jordan. This is both waterfalls and also a river in flood coursing and crashing down to the sea. At the source of, of the Jordan, there's very much lots and lots of waterfalls. But the word rendered waterfall occurs only here, and interestingly, in 2 Samuel 5, verse 8, which is very close to the verse that speaks of David dancing before the Lord, as we, we saw in verse 4. And it may well be that this gives some indication of timing when it was that this priest was uh, around. And then the river crashing out of Israel likens his journey of exile, getting further and further from God, the holy city, Zion. Moving on to verse 8, the word for love is more like grace, in that it speaks of God's loving kindness. Despite the psalmist's depression, God will command his kindness, his love, by day and by night, his song and prayer at night. Often prayer and song are used indiscriminately for any of the hymns in religious use, a natural thought for a, a musician of the sanctuary. It echoes our use of songs and hymns in worship, the singing of the Gloria, light in our darkness, which we are often used to sing, many of the blessings which are sung day and night that are echoes of the sanctuary rituals that took place that he's missing so much. Verse 9, we have the very words of the prayer actually in verse 9. I say to God my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? It's a, a very real sense of outrage. It's a very real honesty. And it reminds us that our prayers also must be honest prayers. Reminds me of the prayer of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cry of dereliction from the cross. Verse 10, my bones suffer mortal agony. The Hebrew has the idea of a sword being pierced into the bones. There is the idea of the crushing of bones. Then the sword goes in and the agony that it creates. And the taunts in this verse are very powerful saying to me all day long, where is your God? Again, echoes of the cross. Jesus' agony and torment of the, the nails being smashed into his bones, of the people all around, baying and criticizing him, the ill treatment that he suffered. But it also reminds us that the psalmist being taken into exile may well have been subjected to physical ill treatment, quite profound physical ill treatment. Prisoners often were being taken into exile with many blows and then insults and and they remind us of the ill treatment that so often people of God receive at the hands of their enemies and then the psalm concludes this part of the psalm anyway with verse 11 going back to the refrain reminding us of the, the sense in which we go from faith from, from disturbance, sorry, disquiet to faith. Why are you so cast down, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. And so it, it reminds us that in all of this psalm, in all of the agony that the psalmist experienced, far from God, far from the sanctuary, being tormented by his enemies, feeling almost abandoned by God, being tormented by the idea that somehow his God was being challenged, perhaps um, deeply challenged by the circumstances that the psalmist is experiencing. Yet we see in the psalm a real sense of hope. Yet I will praise him, my Saviour and my God. 
And I often think one of the great things about being a Christian is that we are at every point able to praise God, even in the deepest of distress. I find often there is a song that sings within me, a song of hope, a song of joy, even in the darkest of times, because I know that God is always with me. I will never leave you or forsake you. The words of Jesus.